So good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and there's so many things that we could talk about when it comes to the technology area. But my area, of course, is artificial intelligence. So I can't um, miss the opportunity to talk about that. And in particular, given the news of the last uh, about three weeks ago, hopefully you caught it, um, I want to talk in particular about um, the regulatory activities that we're doing in the White House. So it's no secret, hopefully, that this administration has prioritized artificial intelligence since the beginning. Um, the president signed the executive order on artificial intelligence almost a year ago. It was February 11th last year. And um, it it includes, the progress over the last year it includes a number of activities, including historic R&D investments, a refreshed strategy for AI research and development, increased federal emphasis on AI technical standards, a strong focus on the development of the AI workforce, and international agreements on principles for the use, use of AI across the board. And so um, there's... Um, the most recent guidance then that I want to talk about today, of course, is the guidance that came out about three weeks ago, as I mentioned. It's the first of its kind guidance on the regulatory approach to the use of AI, AI um, that has teeth to it, so to speak. So um, the policy, if you've had a chance to look at it, the draft policy outlines 10 principles for the use of AI uh, in the private sector, regulatory principles. Now, um, the guidance is now out for public comment. Once it's in final form, then um, the agencies will uh, then uh, begin implementing that across the board. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about what that uh, policy is. So the 10 principles are underpinned by three main goals. Um, the first goal is to ensure public engagement. The second is to limit regulatory overreach. And the third is to promote trustworthy AI. So in the first case, public engagement. Uh, certainly it calls on regulators to base their technical and policy decisions on scientific evidence and to seek the feedback from civil society, academia, industry, and so forth whenever possible uh, before making any kind of regulatory decisions. Second, the federal government should be uh, careful and mindful about limiting regulatory overreach. We want to avoid any sort of one-size-fits-all framework for AI that might hinder the innovation and growth that we could experience through AI. So prior to any regulatory action, agencies will need to consider existing laws, conduct risk assessments and cost-benefit analyses, and consider non-regulatory approaches and pilot programs um, and perhaps even grand challenges. So importantly, the regulators must also consider important issues of privacy, uh, fairness, non-discrimination, openness, transparency, safety, and security, and so forth when deciding regulatory action. So these um, uh, principles then provide those federal agencies those guide the guidance that's needed to address these challenging technical and ethical issues, while at the same time they're promoting the innovation and the positive uses of AI. Now, it's important to recognize that these policies are intentionally high level. They're intended to um, have the agencies then implement the guidance in a sector-specific approach rather than a one-size-fits-all blanket top-down regulation. Um, and so we want to then look at that uh, from a sector-by-sector -sector perspective. So on its face, these principles are common sense, straightforward, pro-innovation and growth approach as they deal with regulatory issues. But they're presented in the context of a number of domestic and international uh, contexts that it's important to consider. Um, and so domestically, here in the United States, you know, there's a lot of talk, obviously, about regulating AI. And I understand there's been discussion here today on this, on this topic. Um, we all care about it, uh, the public, private sector, um, Congress is talking about it and so forth. And these are important um, discussions. In some sense, you don't want to regulate AI too early because then you're ha hampering the innovation. But you also don't want to um, look at regulations too late because then we have a lot of use cases that we um, are not comfortable with and are not consistent with our values. So uh, these conversations, of course, I've participated in many of these and on panels and so forth. And uh, it's important to make sure that we get this right. Um, now, this AI regulatory guidance that has been issued does provide some um, certainty or it reduces the uncertainty to the innovators that are out there about how the federal government will consider the regulation of AI. Um, 
Now, this consistency across the different uh, sectors is important um, because if you have a particular approach to regulation in one sector and a very different approach in another sector, then that is not um, easy for industry to then be able to have a similar product used in multiple domains. And so having an overarching set of principles allows us then to ensure some uh, consistency. But consistency does not mean it's the same regulation for all use cases of AI. We all know that there are particular use cases of AI that present very little possibility for harm. And there are other cases of, of AI, uses of AI that present more serious uh, consequences. And so we want to have the regulatory approach be consistent with that as well, ensuring that we uh, consider AI on a use by use uh, perspective. Um, and that we uh, consider um, the possible benefits from the AI as well as potential risk. I'm a firm believer that it's unethical to not use AI if it can lead to significant benefits. So we can't overregulate to the point where we're actually uh, creating um, a lack of uh, ability to address and achieve these benefits that we um, all believe are important. So we can ensure that consistency while at the same time making sure that uh, we're um, advancing innovation across the, the sectors. So um, in, in the international area then, um, and looking at this, we know that countries around the world are also grappling with these regulatory challenges. Um, certainly the European Union has made it very clear that uh, they plan to release very soon um, at least a white paper or some uh, regulatory guidance as it relates to artificial intelligence. Our belief is that the framework that we've put forward in the, um, the regulatory memo that put, that's been um, shared is now something that can serve as a framework for, for everyone. And so we encourage um, looking at that more deeply to make sure that as we develop AI, it is de developed in a way that reflects our shared values of freedom and human rights and, and civil liberties. Um, and so I think um, just recently, last week, in fact, a number of EU officials were here and we had the, um, a good opportunity to visit with a number of them and talk about these. And I think it's very clear that at the, at the level of discussion of values, we have so much in common. And so I think it's, it's heartening to, to um, recognize that in the free world, of course, we um, are consistent in wanting to make sure that the values that AI uh, reflects, that the use cases of AI um, are consistent across the board. Um, there's a lot of concern, of course, about authoritarian uses of AI. And um, our belief is that the best way to counter those authoritarian uses is for those of us in the free world to make sure that AI is, we continue to innovate in AI, we continue to benefit from AI, at the same time, um, looking at those regulatory approaches that are needed to ensure that the AI reflects our values, our shared values. And so um, we caution against any kind of um, preemptive and burdensome regulations because um, that will um, not only stifle the domestic innovation and economic growth, but it will also stifle global competitiveness. Um, given the rise of authoritarian um, governments that have no qualms about using AI, um, having their AI be used to track and surveil people and imprison people, we want to be careful that we don't over control our AI system to the point where we run uh, businesses out of, of uh, companies out of business and we no longer have any trusted sources of this kind of technology. We have to be very careful about a reactionary approach. We have to be careful not to overreach and say, okay, we're going to ban certain technology. And certainly the hot topic right now is in facial recognition. I reckon um, some many proposals are saying, let's just outright ban it. But certainly that then um, creates other challenges. If you ban the use of, say, facial recognition by the federal government, then that means that a lot of beneficial uses cannot also be experienced. For instance, it could prevent agencies from using facial recognition in order to control access to sensitive uh, secure facilities, um, which is common practice in many places. It could prevent law enforcement from be being able to um, help rescue victims of human trafficking. It could prevent first responders from identifying victims of nat national, uh, natural disasters. Um, it could tie the hands of those who are working hard to protect us from terrorism. And importantly, as I've noted, it would also help our adversaries move ahead of us technologically. So we could drive our own companies out of business and then only leave unsecure, untrustworthy sources for critical technology. 
So we believe that the regulatory approach that's laid out in the draft memo that's been released balances these goals. It balances the goals of advancing AI innovation through light touch regulations, while also ensuring that um, higher risk use cases um, are governed more closely so that their application is consistent with our nation's values. So this uh, release of this uh, memo then kickstarts uh, a larger process at the White House and across the federal agencies. The draft of the principles, as I mentioned, is open for public comment. Um, and certainly we um, hope that all of you will look it up and, and provide some comment. It's available on the Federal Register. If you just go to the Federal Register, search for artificial intelligence, it's one of the first things, if not the first thing that pops up. And then you'll see that there and see how to um, submit comments. It's now open in, uh, through March the 12th, uh, 13th, and so um, it's, it's open for feedback. Now what will happen next is once that uh, comment period closes and we we'll receive all the feedback, we will uh, incorporate, address those comments into a final version of the memo, and then the memo will be become final and it'll be issued to the agencies. The agencies will then have 180 days in order to uh, come up with their own plans for how to be consistent with this memo. So it, um, the, the memo requires them to do a number of things as they develop this plan. One is to define their regulatory authorities as it relates to the use cases of AI within their regulatory authorities. Second is un informed by stakeholder uh, engagement. They will list out and prioritize particular use cases of AI that they think are most important within their regulatory authorities. They'll also report on existing processes, policies, or regulation that might be inhibiting the use of AI within their regulatory domains. And they're gonna describe any sorts of planned um, or considered regulatory approaches to those use cases. If nothing else, that's a good accounting and um, across all of the agencies of the use cases and the agency's perspectives on the use cases of AI. And then they will take this and uh, be considering their own applications uh, of, the regulatory, of these principles in the, in the regulatory domain. Now, it's important to recognize in the context of regulatory uh, uh, approaches, it, it's important to uh, note the importance of technical standards. Um, as required by uh, the President's executive order, NIST issued a plan uh, back in August for advancing the development of technical standards for um, aspects such as AI performance, measurement, security, risk management, trustworthiness, and safety. Um, in August, they released this plan, and this plan is important, and, and just the development of t AI technical standards is important because it provides important mechanisms for us to evaluate and compare different AI systems. And if you think about regulations, a lot of times we think about, well, we want to make sure a system is fair, or it's explainable, or it's safe. But if we don't have measurements and abilities to determine whether or not an AI system is explainable, fair, and safe, then we can't achieve the ultimate goal. And so technical standards give us a mechanism for uh, measuring and comparing systems to see if they have these kinds of characteristics. Um, often, we talk about explainability, for instance, in AI. And we know that uh, there's a trade-off between performance of AI systems and explainability. Um, some AI systems are explainable, but their performance is not as good as other kinds of AI systems um, that perform better, but we can't really understand how they work. And so this is a trade-off. Um, and again, technical standards will allow us to measure and compare these different kinds of systems. NIST is working very hard in this space. And, um, and they're doing the R&D that's needed in order to inform the development of all these technical standards. But this is not work that can be done overnight. And so they require significant research and development in order to determine the appropriate approach to these technical standards and, and development. And so that then leads to the importance of research and development. Uh, the first priority in the President's um, American AI Strategy Initiative is on research and development. And so we need to invest in R&D so that we can have the scientific breakthroughs that will allow us to not only develop the technical standards, but advance the field in general. Um, if you look at what DARPA is doing in this space, they've been investing in explainable AI. NSF is investing in fair and trustworthy AI. And NIST, of course, is investing in a variety of different approaches to advance our understanding and how to create trustworthy AI. Um, 
Now, just uh, recently, um, this past fall, um, we, um, in order to account for all of this R&D, we had the first ever budget roll-up of the agency AI R&D investments. And that showed that the agency, the uh, administration, uh, the agencies have invested in almost a billion dollars of federal R&D investments. That was what was proposed for FY 2020, and Congress did approve these budgets across uh, NSF and NIST and DOE and so forth. So for perspective, in 2016, the total AI R&D budget was a billion dollars, which included defense. Um, this most recent accounting then does not include in de defense. So it's a, about a billion dollars of non-defense spending. And so that clearly shows that the R&D budgets have, have gone up in the non-defense um, areas uh, pretty significantly over a short period of time. And of course, our goal is to continue to grow those. So guiding these investments was the National AI R&D Strategic Plan, the 2019 update that we released. And then also um, we released a 2016 to 2019 progress report on those R&D investments that shows the wide variety of uh, agencies that are involved in these areas and the diverse kinds of advances that they're making. Um, in addition, the agencies themselves are doing a lot in AI. If you look at DOD, they launched their joint AI center back in 2018. NIH released their strategic plan for data science uh, about the same time. Um, their, um, DARPA also started their $2 billion AI Next campaign um, in, in, in um, that same time frame, about September of 2018. DOE more recently launched their AI and technology office this past September. NSF launched a new program for national AI R&D institutes together with USDA, DOT, DHS, and VA uh, just this past October. And NOAA uh, proposed their AI strategy most recently, and um, the VA opened their National AI Institute in December. So there's an enormous amount of activity across the federal government, uh, both at the interagency level and at the individual agency level. So importantly, we know that all of this investment activity um, is contributing to the broad innovation ecosystem. On top of that are all the investments that are being made in the private sector and in academia that do help contribute and make the, the nation a leader in AI uh, R&D and AI in general. So with that, I'll conclude. I do want to make one important point uh, at the end, which is that global leadership on AI matters. It matters because we can shape the evolution and the development of AI in a way that's consistent with our values, but also at the same time ensures that we remain the leaders in innovation. And so that's something that um, we continue to press forward for in the R&D space, in the uh, technical standard space, in regulatory space, in education and workforce space, in international uh, engagement as well, and national security as well. So the objective, of course, with all of this is to improve lives improve economic competitiveness, and improve our national security for all Americans. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs> Understand there's a microphone somewhere. Yes, I see a question here up front. Mike Nelson with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We just recently, we, just before we had a breakout on artificial intelligence and putting the question was whether to put the brakes on AI. One thing that came through very clearly was that nobody has a consistent definition of AI. How hard was it to do the budget breakout? I mean, defining what is and is not in the federal research budget in this area must have been incredibly hard. It is. It is hard to define, um, and we don't have a definition that we would give you, but we have a scoping statement that helps us decide what, um, what is AI and, and what's not, what's in and what's not. And um, that's the way that we approach this. Certainly definitions um, are a dime a dozen. Um, when, it, when it comes to our perspective, the only legislated uh, definition is the, the definition that's in the FY. 19 NDAA, and so we, we point to that as a definition. The challenge with those kinds of definitions, though, is that it's hard to operationalize it. And so if you have a program and you see a definition, you have to then subjectively decide, is this program doing those things or not those things? And so a scoping statement uh, tends to um, describe the characteristics that we're looking for, things like we want to be advancing the state of the field of AI, and AI tools consist of Here's a laundry list of common AI tools. If you're not just using the tool, but um, coming up with new ways of it, uh, applying the tool, 
um, in novel ways are also coming, creating new tools in this suite, then that would count as, as AI R&D. So you're somehow pushing the state of the field in either the fundamentals of AI or in the uh, how it's being applied in particular areas uh, that require actually innovat innovative ideas for the application of AI as well. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about explainability? Because when AI isn't explainable, it's a black box. And since half of its name is intelligence, people tend to take it as gospel and infallible and correct. Um, how is explainability being pursued? And what, what does it actually mean in terms of standards and applications as they're developed? So there is a window into how it reached a conclusion, how a car did something, how a medical diagnosis was reached, so that it's auditable rather than just either believe it or don't. Yeah, so there's certainly a lot of technical work in this space going on. Uh, there are different ways to think about um, explainability from a technical pr pr uh, approach, perspective. Um, and on the one hand, you can have certain types of um, AI approaches that are inherently more explainable. So uh, many people are familiar with decision trees because we use them as humans. And in a decision tree, you can see what branches were taken, and then that gives you some sense of understanding. Um, neural nets, of course, are what people tend to call deep neural nets or what people tend to call black boxes. And it's true, it's hard to understand in many cases what's happening there, although there is a lot of advancement in understanding which parameters are important or which parts maybe of an image the, the net is paying attention to and so forth. One of the things that you can do technically is to um, have sort of a proxy for that net using a different kind of AI tool that maybe doesn't have the same performance but can uh, effectively estimate the performance of the neural net, but it's in a form that's more understandable. And so if you can have those sort of aligned, then you can say, well, it sort of behaves the same way, not quite as well, but we can understand this one. And so that one can give us insight into understanding the other, uh, the other tool. And there are a lot of other kinds of, of approaches technically that are being explored uh, for uh, explainable AI. It's, it's not always the case that this you have to decide between performance and explainability. Uh, in some cases, the explainability approaches to AI can give you insight into the other tool, which can then allow you to change the way you're developing uh, the more high-performing tool. Uh, and, you, uh, and in that way, you're not only uh, understanding it, but you're also in creating a system that performs better as well. But we're still a ways from having the ability to compare two systems and uh, say with a technical standard, say this one has the explainability seal of approval and, and this one does not. And there's also the issue of who you're explaining it to. You can be explaining it to the developer, you can be explaining it to the user, you can be explaining it to so many different people with different roles in the whole uh, scenario. And so the different the ways that you're explaining are very different. So it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Question here. Hi, Dr. Parker. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, Adam Thier with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Um, the guidance that the uh, administration released uh, this month has an interesting section on non-regulatory approaches to AI and specifies that agencies can consider uh, sector-specific policy guidance or frameworks, pilot programs or experiments, or voluntary consensus standards. I was wondering if you could maybe talk us through a little bit about the vision there and maybe even some examples of how that could play out for uh, agencies. Absolutely. Um Certainly, um, the, the theme and, and certainly the discussions that we've had about this is uh, across the board is, is very much thinking about it in terms of a light touch on regulation, of not saying that we require regulation across the board. There may be, for many kinds of applications, um, uh, approaches like sandboxing, for instance, that will allow you a regulatory sandboxing that can allow you to explore um, certain uh, uses of AI and the implications of it in a safe space where everyone who's in that space operating is, um, you know, consented to, um, to, to using it and so forth. And so it, it's an important mechanism for us not to jump from we don't understand AI to now we're going to regulate a AI to um, acknowledging that we're still sort of early in the process. And it gives us a pathway forward for learning about good ways of, of, of governing these technologies so that we don't jump and make some mistake and uh, create some sort of uh, official policy or official governance approach that doesn't work well in practice. And so there are, you know, we often talk about the, the regulation of drones as an example of, um, of where these pilot projects are particularly helpful. You don't, um, you know, the, the drones are not able to be flown um, 
according to exist, pre previously according to existing FAA rules, with the pilot projects that were put into place a couple of years ago, it allowed um, a multi-stakeholder approach to figuring out what's the best approach to, uh, to thinking about regulation. And then now we're beginning to see more um, refined regulation on these that allows these drones to be used in a number of different um, application domains. And so you can think about that in a lot of different sectors. If you think about what FDA did with uh, enabling the use of, um, um, of medical devices that are AI enabled, those kinds of approaches didn't require new regulations so much as they required a new way of thinking about the existing regulatory approach. And so um, certainly the memo encourages that kind of thinking across the board. The first choice should not necessarily be let's go and write a regulation, but it could be let's experiment. Uh, could you briefly expand on the subject of international cooperation? You, you mentioned it, and obviously transatlantic cooperation is, is not hard to figure out, probably bilateral discussions with EU, but have you contemplated or are engaged in discussions either through the OECD or through the UN or discussions that would involve more than a handful of European countries that would, would have similar perspective and similar concerns. Yeah, of course. Um, so last spring, um, we it actually started more than a, a year ago. Um, there was a process uh, at the OECD to use a network of experts, AI experts, to craft uh, international principles for the use of AI, uh, in particular for the creation of um, and stewardship of trustworthy AI. And so we were very happy to participate in that project and shepherd that project so that now all the OECD nations last spring signed on to or agreed to these uh, 10 principles for uh, trustworthy AI. Um, the G20 shortly thereafter also adopted some a very similar set of principles. And, and so at that level, when you think about what are our principles, that's important to make sure that we're all on the same page. The important challenge now to address, though, is how do you implement those principles? And so internationally, um, we continue to believe that the OECD is doing, um, is doing a lot of work in this space. Um, next month, they will be launching the OECD AI Policy Observatory. And that's an international approach that allows all nations to be able to share their policy approaches to the use of AI, and we can all learn. I don't think it's, it's reasonable to think that every culture on the planet will have exactly the same approach to the use of AI. But we can learn from each other, but we need mechanisms for that. And so the, the um, OECD work through the AI Policy Observatory is something we certainly support, and it's a mechanism that allows that information sharing. Again, recognizing that it's still early now, and so we need to learn about um, all these different use cases and approaches to governance. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I know regulations at the end of the afternoon are a little hard, so thank you.